Good morning. We, you heard about all the great things ABB has produced over the last 100 plus years. How many of you know ABB also was the inventor of Skype? No? Okay, just kidding. Just wanted to let you know that all great things don't come from ABB. There are great things which other people outside create as well. Small companies, companies with one or two or five people, and what I do is look for these kind of companies all over the world. So just think about this. If a, a Nokia or a Deutsche Telekom or an AT&T would have invested in Skype, what would, have, what would that have done to their business model? Rather than disrupting those companies, they would have been able to co-op them and work with them. So one of the things, so let's talk about what ABB Technology Ventures does and why it's important for ABB. In a nutshell, what ABB Technology Ventures is, is we are a venture capital firm, except that we are owned by ABB, and we invest in early stage companies all around the world. So we look for small companies, innovative companies, and we invest in them. And just as, you know, we are sort of a legally separate company, we have invested about 122 million so far. Uh, on an annual basis, we invest anywhere from 20 to 50 million dollars. Uh, but those are kind of details which are less important. Let's talk about why we do this and, and how exciting it is for us. Uh, if you are a pure venture capital firm, the only thing you're interested in is financial return. So if you come to me with a business plan or a new technology and say, look, this is fantastic, this is even better than Skype, instead of just seeing each other, you can actually create holograms of people and if you feel like you're talking to each other across the table, I say, fantastic. The only problem is it has not just to make money, but if I as ABB invest, it has to have some strategic value for me. So that is my only constraint. It has to make money, but it also has to have some strategic value to ABB, okay? So once you get these two, then we are no different than any other VC. So the question does becomes this, you know, some of you may be thinking, why does ABB need a corporate venture group? We have 6,000 PhDs, we have research in, you know, uh, research centers in, in, in India, in China, in, in, in Germany, in Sweden, in the US, you know, over the last 100, years we have created some of the most exciting technologies, so why are we going out there and looking at these things? If you remember, Intel Corporation had a very famous CEO and one of the founders called Andy Grove, and some of you know he probably grew up in one of your neighboring countries, originally Hungarian. And when Andy Grove retired, he wrote a book, and the title of the book was Only the Paranoid Survive. Okay. And if you are in Silicon Valley, you have to be paranoid. You have to be constantly looking over your shoulder because it doesn't matter who you are. You can be Intel, you can be Microsoft, you can be Google, you can be Yahoo, you can be Cisco. It does not matter who you are because somewhere in Silicon Valley or somewhere in Tallinn or somewhere in Shanghai, some five people and a dog are sitting in a little room on a program, working away, and they will make you obsolete. It won't take 10 years for them to make you obsolete. It may take a couple of years. It won't take a couple of months. If you look back at the early days of the Internet, how many of you remember names like Alta Vista, Lycos, America Online? AOL was supposed to dominate the industry. You didn't need the World Wide Web. All you needed to do was go to AOL. What about MySpace? Friendster. These were dominant companies at one point. Today, nobody talks of them. And you don't have to look too far. Look at Motorola. Look at Nokia. So you have to be paranoid. You have to be constantly looking over your shoulders. Okay? Microsoft is afraid of Google. You know who's Google afraid of? Google is afraid of Facebook. And the reason very simply is Google's foundation is email. And in Facebook, you can do peer-to-peer -peer messaging. Or you can do one-to-many messaging. You don't need email anymore. Right? 
What's, you, you've seen programs like WhatsApp. You don't need instant messaging anymore. The telecom companies lost re voice revenue because everybody was using instant messaging. But they've also lost revenue from instant messaging because people are using WhatsApp. So it's a long way of saying you have to be paranoid because those five guys and a dog sitting somewhere are going to make you obsolete. Now, ABB didn't have to worry about this for a number of reasons. Okay? So for the last 100 years, our competitors were the same. If you ask any ABB person who is your competition, it's, oh, it's Siemens, it's Schneider, it's Alstom, it's Arriva, it's you know, Mitsubishi, those, the, the usual suspects. And what helped us was our technology really didn't change in the last 100 years, in that the, the principle of a motor is the same today as it was 100 years ago. The principle of a transformer is the same today as it was 100 years ago. The only thing different is we've made them bigger, we've made them smaller, we've made them more efficient, we've made them cheaper, faster, whatever. Okay? But today we have to be paranoid. There are lots of things happening. The two major drivers of why we need to be paranoid today, one is the change from digital, sorry, from analog to digital technology. We are not living in an analog world anymore. And the moment you talk of a digital technology, you're not talking bits and bytes. You're now talking networks. You're not talking databases. You're not talking cybersecurity. You're talking a whole bunch of different things. And in as much as the five guys and a dog couldn't come up with the next transformer because it takes too much money to do that, the five guys and a dog can come up with new kinds of digital technology as it relates to smart grids, as it relates to EV charging, as it relates to a lot of technologies. And the second thing which has changed amongst many, is the, are the advances in material science. So whether you see things in turbines, whether you see things in PV, whether you see things in membranes for, uh, you know, for, for, for water uh, distillation and other things, or whether you see things in, in, in power electronics, these are changes which are happening. And all these changes can be done by small companies funded by, early, by, by venture capital companies. Okay. So from that perspective, we have to start becoming paranoid. And not everything can be done by ABB engineers sitting in Vestros or in Heidelberg or in Mannheim or in Bangalore or in Shanghai. There are hundreds and thousands of these people out there, and we need to keep an eye on them. In fact, I spent half, most of yesterday meeting with a lot of the, with, with the, with the uh, Estonian development authority and, and, and some of the local VCs and met with some of the early stage companies from Estonia. And there's some exciting stuff happening. Some very young people I met. In fact, I'm sure half the people I met have not even started shaving yet. But they were very passionate, they were very excited, and they had some lots of interesting things. So just a long way of saying there are new technologies emerging, whether it's in terms of renewables, whether it's in terms of cyber security, whether it's in terms of smart grid. These are things which early stage companies are doing all the time. The other thing, as I told you earlier, is because of this, who our competition is, is changing. It's not just Siemens and Schneider and Alstom. It's all these companies out there. It's Oracle, it's Microsoft, it's Google. Now you would say, why is ABB competing with Google? Where is ABB competing with, with Apple? The answer is in home automation, in energy management. These are areas where we bump into them. We bump into Cisco, if we bump into Oracle, we bump into SAP in the whole smart grid space. SAP has a business where it does analytics of the grid efficiency. How many of you know Procter & Gamble? You know the name Procter & Gamble? You know, they are, they are known for their shampoos and their, and their diapers, right? So you say, why is ABB competing with Procter & Gamble's? Has ABB decided to make an electrical diaper? Well, the answer is Procter & Gamble owns a company called Duracell. And Duracell, as you may know, makes batteries. But today they make small batteries, batteries for things like this, or batteries for your transistor radios, et cetera. And they're using this battery technology to move upstream, to move into bigger batteries, big, into storage technology whether it's battery backups for electric car charging, whether it's grid storage batteries, and suddenly 
a company we never ever thought we would ever bump up against is now our competitor. So these are reasons we have to start getting paranoid. Now, the other reason is you also have other companies having their own corporate venture groups. So everybody's now realized that, look, it's not just that the, all the smart people are in our, your own company. There are lots of very smart people, very young people all over the world. And so other companies have created their own corporate venture groups. So whether it's our co competitors, such as Siemens and Arriva and, and Alstom, or whether it's other companies like Dow and, 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 and BASF, et cetera, they, are, they have formed their own early stage companies. And we bump up into them all the time. You know, GM, we bump up into electric car charging. Dow and Total and BP into renewables. These are all companies we interact with, we, we work with. So the world has changed now. It's not the same world where everything was defined and everybody had a place. Everybody in, is in everybody's business today. So how do we differentiate ourselves from R&D or from corporate business development? If you look at this chart here, if you look at the proximity to the market and the proximity to current technology, R&D is the first arc. They are focusing on what our current customers want, and they're focusing on what our current technology is and trying to take it to the next step. The business development folks in the various businesses are looking further down. Okay? So if you think about this, the people running the business today are thinking about the next quarter. They're thinking about next year at the most because they have to make the numbers. They have to deliver on what they have promised from the budget perspective. The people doing corporate business development are looking, or the people in strategy are looking two or three years out and saying, what do we want to do? What do we see happening? What's happening in the economy? What's happening in China? Is China slowing down? Is the US slowing down? Will the US go over a cliff if they can't have a budget agreement? And what does that mean for our business? So they're two or three years out. We in ABB Technology Ventures are looking five or 10 years out. We are seeing what are the disruptive technologies out there? What can put us out of business? What can affect some of our companies? And that's why, and you can do many different things. You can say, okay, I'm gonna ignore it because if I think about it, I get a heart attack. And then you put your head in the sand like an ostrich and then you become the next Nokia. Or you can say, I will try to do it on my own, but then you don't have all the resources and you can't do everything. Or you say, I'm going to watch these folks and maybe invest in some of these companies which look promising and keep an eye on them and potentially if they look like they're succeeding, I might even acquire some of them. So that's one of our activities. So I look at my job partly as helping ABB become more paranoid. Rather than saying, we know everything, we have done everything, we have all the greatest inventions, I want us to become paranoid. I want us to be looking over our shoulder all the time. I want to say, what are the smart people in Silicon Valley thinking? What are the smart people in Tallinn thinking? What are the smart people in Bangalore thinking? What are the smart people in, 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 in Shanghai thinking? That's what I want to know. And, and not the big companies, but I want these hungry young people, those five guys and a dog, that's who I'm keeping an eye on. I just wanted to share with you some of this, those of you in the technology space may already know, but just, just share with you the kind of things we are seeing out there and things we want to keep an eye on and things we want to leverage. First and foremost is the concept of the Internet of Things. So it's not just your telephone and your computer and other things which are now IP enabled. You, you, everyone knows what a smartphone is. You know, everyone uses it, and Tallinn and, and Estonia is, is one of the most advanced in terms of e-government, e-health, paying for your parking with your you know, phone, etc. But now other things, whether it's your fridge, whether it's your oven, whether it's your television, whether it's things in the factories, all of them will eventually get IP addresses, and everything will become one huge giant network, and you can talk to each other, and, and you can control each thing. And then the question will arise then, where does intelligence reside? Does, is the intelligence uh, you know, local or is it embedded in the instrument? Is it central? Is it a combination of both, etc.? But these are things which are going to happen, and these are happening already. The next thing from the Internet of Things is big data. 
because there are sensors all over the place, there is information all over the place, there is activity all over the place. What do you do with all that data which is generated? For which you need lots of memory, lots of analytics, and lots of, lots of ways of mining that information and learning. Today, you have a company like General Electric, which has sensors in each and every one of its aircraft engines. Every single day, they download the behavior of those engines, and they analyze it. You know, you, you, can, you can slice and dice it, what's happening by different countries, by different weather patterns, by different flight patterns, by different maintenance schedules, and that becomes very, very, very valuable in terms of learning. I mean, just think if ABB had sensors on all its motors, on all its transformers, on all its robots, and we were able to get that terabytes of data every day and analyze it. What could we do with that, both in terms of predictive maintenance, in terms of condition monitoring, in terms of designing future products? Uh, the other interesting point we have noticed is the notion of technology transfer or movement. If you think about this, historically, technology moved from the military or the industry because they are the ones with the big budgets and they are the ones who made big things. And then over time, people said, let's adapt it for consumer use. So whether it's the Velcro and then the ballpoint pen developed by NASA or the, uh, or, or the um, you know, PV cells, etc., it always started in industry and moved down. But now, all of you are having smartphones. Most of you have iPads. You use social media. You use Twitter. These are all consumer-driven inventions. And now for the, for, there's a different value chain. Companies and industries and militaries starting to say, hey, wait a minute, how can we leverage this? How should we use social media for our benefit? How should we use Twitter for our benefit? How sh you know, and I'm sure Anders will talk about this at some point, but then you know, rather than using our traditional controllers, how can we use iPads for programming our robots? So technology is moving in the other direction. It is the common man today who is driving technology. And then, of course, you can see there's a whole bunch of things in there. I won't spend too much time. But the one point I will spend on very a couple of moments is the notion of 3D printing. I don't know if people have heard about this, but you can actually print in three dimensions. So you can print a shoe at home, or you can print your clothes at home, or you can print spare parts at home. I mean, today it's still at an early stage, and you can only use thermal plastics and you know, develop certain things. But it's, you know, think of this as the early 80s when you had people who were hackers who were building their own laptops or their own computers on, based on kits. But over time, this became industrialized and became standardized. And this will happen too. So once, if, you, if people can build things at home, just think about the disruption that will have on industry. This is just a simple cons you know, thing we do, evaluating what are the different areas we want to focus on, whether it's renewables, smart grids, energy efficiency, things like that. So you know, smart lighting, smart cities. So this is, in our mind, the areas we want to focus on. And this changes on a quarterly or annual basis based upon what we see happening out there in the venture capital world and what we see as the needs from our businesses. Just want to spend a few minutes talking with you about some of the investments we have made, just to sort of give you a flavor for the kind of things we have done. So we invest globally. We have invested in China. We invested in Israel. We've invested in the UK. We invested in the US. Uh, hopefully, in the next few months, we will find an attractive investment in, in Estonia as well. So the first company is Trilliant, which is a company in the smart grid space. It's basically a wireless communications company. It takes information from smart meters and then collects that information and then sends it back to the utility. It's not just about reducing the number of meter readers to send out to collect. But as utilities are becoming more efficient and as you have feed-in tariffs, as you have time of day usage, the two-way communication with meters becomes very important. And so this real-time information gathering becomes critical. Industrial Defender is a cybersecurity company. I don't need to tell you folks how important cybersecurity is. If I'm not wrong, Estonia has had its own challenges with, with people or countries trying to hack. 
And that is, it's not just the 13-year-old, you know, geek or nerd sitting in his bedroom trying to hack into the Pentagon and to show his friends how smart he is. Now you have organized crime, you have countries doing cyber hacking or other things. So this has become a very critical issue for industrial networks, for utility networks, etc. And it's an area where we want to focus on. Power Assure is in the data center energy management. As you know, all of us have smartphones, and all of us use emails, and all of us use texting and SMS, etc. All this has generated a significant demand for data centers. So whether you're on Facebook, or whether you're using Google, or whether you're using Amazon, or anything else, data centers are critical, because that's where the data is stored, that's where the data is taken from, that's where the data is sent back to. But data centers are huge users of electricity. And historically, people didn't worry about it because access to the data was important in a timely manner. But now people are becoming increasingly sensitive to the, to the need for energy efficiency in data centers. So what Power Assure does, and this is, the, the, is it predicts the amount of traffic a website or a server may have based upon the time of the day or the time of the week or the time of the month. And it makes its data, the servers, available, always available rather than always on. So it increases the availability up or down based upon certain predictions and certain heuristics it has. I'll just spend a couple of minutes on the... Pentelum is a, a company in Israel. And like most early stage companies in Israel, the technology comes out of the military. So a lot of the Israelis go serve in the military for two years, work on some exciting technology, and then leave and then start companies based on those. And for some reason, the Israeli defense industry is not worried about IP issues, etc. They let them do it, so there is a huge ecosystem in Israel around companies which come out of the defense. So this was a technology. This uses lasers. You're all familiar with radar. Radar uses sound waves. This is the same concept, except it uses lasers. So it's called LIDAR. So it uses light lasers to measure and the, the speed and direction of wind. So this has, initially it was used so that the Israelis could aim their missiles a lot more accurately. But we're using it for windmills. So if you have that, you can then predict the wind, then you can change the pitch or the yaw of the turbine and make the turbines much more efficient. And even if you increase the efficiency by 5 or 10%, for a wind farm, that is very, very powerful and very, very economically beneficial. You can also predict whether a certain site is a good site for wind turbines using this technology. So rather than taking a chance that this looks like a good site, you can actually test it. Aquamarine is generating energy from the wind, from, from, the, from the waves. I mean, if you look about, if you think about it, the ocean and the water is far more than the land, about two to th you know, three to one size. But we really don't have today an efficient economical way of leveraging the ocean or the tides. So there's a lot of activity happening in the UK and other places to leverage oceans and tides to, to generate electricity. And so we have invested in a, a wave company, and we're hoping to close an investment in a tidal company as well. And Ecotality is in the, in the fast charging business. Um, just as an aside, we have also, we don't normally do that, but we have invested in three different funds. One which focuses on clean tech in China, one which is more European based, and one which is more American based. The other thing you know, we have done is, initially we looked, you know, we look at about a thousand deals a year. So there is a great amount of transactions we see from all over the world. Now, if we were financial venture capitalists, we would say, you know, no, 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 this doesn't make money, this is not interesting, etc. Because our only purpose would be to make money. But as corporate investors, it's not just about money, but we also want to learn about what is happening out there from a strategic point of view. What are people looking at? What are people investing in? What are people inventing? How would this impact our various businesses? So we spend the time to look at most of these thousand companies. And even if we don't invest in most of them, we want our businesses to know, hey, there are some smart people sitting in Tallinn who are thinking about this industry. We just came across a company called Defendec yesterday, which does perimeter monitoring. 
Okay? And that's something which could be interesting for us in our oil and gas business, in our substation automation business to track security and other things. But we also step back and say, okay, that's very reactive. People come to us, we look at that, but why don't we also evaluate what are the new areas we should do? So we also step back and we say, let's do a bottom-up analysis of various industries. So we have done kind of bottom-up analysis of energy storage, micro-inverters, waste to energy, uh, lighting control, waste heat recovery. I mean, in industry, there's so much of energy and heat being generated which is lost. Can we recover some of that and recycle it? Uh, this is just our team. Uh, so the long and short of it is we are here to, we are not replacing our R&D. Our R&D is obviously very, very critical. We are not replacing the development that's happening in our businesses. But what we are trying to do is look at new opportunities. We're looking at situations where we look at companies and say, is this a technology we want to keep an eye on? Is this something which could be disruptive to us? Is this a technology we may want to acquire at some point? Is this a business we may want to enter in at some point? And once in a while, we also invest in a company because we want to support the industry. And we want to support the industry because as the industry grows, they will buy more and more products from ABB. And so there are a number of reasons why we invest. But one of the best parts about my job is besides seeing all the very exciting technologies, I get to meet some very, very smart people and some very, very passionate people. And I met some of them yesterday, and it is a very exciting part of what I do. So thank you very much for this opportunity, and if anybody has any questions, I would be happy to answer. Thank you, Mr. Nakani, for this very interesting presentation. We have uh, here two questions. So, do you work with some Estonian startup at this moment already? Uh, we are looking at them. Uh, we did talk to a company called Goliath Wind. Mm -hmm. uh, had some f exciting technology, some very interesting technology. We need to figure out strategically where it would fit in, because we have some concerns about channel conflict. But if we can't invest, we will make sure that they, we find them some other investors to talk to. Uh, as I mentioned to you yesterday, we talked to a company called Defendec. We talked to some companies in battery management systems. So we have seen some very interesting technologies, which we haven't made an investment yet, but we are out there talking to them. And you know, we met with the people from Ambient Sound Investments and the mm -hmm. Estonian Development Authority. So we are very excited about all the, techno all the talent out there and, and would love to uh, find more companies. Very good to hear. Very good to hear. Okay, um, then the second question um, is like that. Does ABB use remote viewing for discovering new technologies? Uh, I'm not sure what, it, what, what the question means, remote I'm viewing. I'm not out to be very honest. Okay. <laughs> but um, if, there, if, if the person asking the question is in the audience, please Feel free to explain what that question means. Kas isik, kes on selle küsimus esitanud, sooviks korra kommenteerida oma küsimust, et täpsustada veidi selle sisu? Inimselt, uh, okay. supposedly, nobody wants to explain it more detail, okay. so... Okay, uh, I mean, if, if by that you mean, are we sort of watching what's happening far away? Uh, absolutely. Uh, you know, in the old days, Everybody thought, you know, these were only the five or six or ten countries which had all the technology and the engineers, and that's not true anymore. We're seeing great technology coming out of all kinds of places. By the way, do you know in, in mobile technology, you know, if, if, you know where some of the most compelling applications are coming in mobile technology from? Kenya. How many people would have thought that an African country would be on the cutting edge of one of the most cutting edge technologies. And the reason very simple is a lot of the mobile payment technology is coming out of Kenya. Okay. So you just can't assume 
that it's only the US or Germany or Sweden or any of these places. There are smart people all over the place. And so, yes, if by remote viewing you mean do we look at things all around the world? Absolutely. And when you're paranoid, you don't know where the danger is coming from. That's the whole point of being paranoid, right? Okay, thank you. And the third question would be, what benefit does uh, ABB uh, uh, Technology Ventures see and realize while investing in tech funds versus companies directly? Okay. That, that, that's an excellent question. Lots of companies like IBM and, uh, and, and Intel and others, or Dow, do investments directly as well as in funds. We actually have a preference not to invest in funds, but to invest directly. And the reason is because we want to invest in order to get a relationship with the company and the relationship with the uh, founders and, and really get close to those companies. But we have made three exceptions in this case. The first exception was in the China Cleantech Fund. And the reason very simply was, although we are pretty large in China and we have been in China for a very long time, in fact, what a lot of people don't know is ABB sold its first transformer in China over 100 years ago. So it isn't that our CEO opened a business week 20 years ago and said, oh, time to go to China. You know, we have been there much longer than people realize. But we know the commercial world. We don't know the early stage world, which is linked to universities and linked to small startups. That's a world we don't really know. So we thought investing in a local fund, which is one of the leading funds, would help us get access to those investments and, and those technologies and, and, and understand. So we sort of hired a guide for us out there. Uh, the second fund was a Zurich-based fund, and it was partly to be a good citizen in Zurich, but also that fund was mostly funded by other corporates, like Dow and BASF and Bosch and others. So we thought this was a good way for us to interact with other corporates and learn what they are doing. And the third fund was, is, is in the US, and it was started by a major utility in the US, formerly known as Florida Power and Light, and now known as Next Era. And the, the theory there was, if you have technologies in the power generation or distribution or smart grid or other space, the two critical players to give, in you know, every startup needs val validation. Every startup needs revenues. Every startup needs a major customer to get it off the ground. And so if you have a major utility which can provide that kind of validation, and then you have a major supplier or an industrial company like ABB, which can help the company on its research and development and, and market access and taking it global, we thought the combination of these two would be very powerful. And not only would we be able to attract good investments, but we can help these investments grow and therefore make our money work higher. So these are very clear exceptions as to why we did it. But as a rule, we don't invest in funds. We prefer to invest in companies directly. OK, thank you very much. Ultimately interesting topic, but I'm afraid we have to proceed now with our program. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Bye-bye.